All right, and we're live. Thank you all for tuning in. I see some familiar names. I have to give a uh, shout out to Martin Glenn, one of our very first Widgmo customers back in 2009 or 10. It's good to see you in here. Thank you for joining. I believe I believe you were using Widgmo in uh, Visual Fox Pro at the time, if I remember, which was pretty amazing. So. Without further ado, let's begin. Uh, so thank you all for attending. Uh, today is the released webcast for Widgmo 2021 V1. This is our uh, first major release of the year. It has some very interesting new components and features in it. Um, we'll go over that today. So, uh, Today's team, myself, Chris Bannon, I am the Global Product Manager for Widgmo at Grape City. Uh, I'll be giving a high-level overview of what's inside the release. Uh, and I have Joel Parks, the Technical Engagement Engineer for Widgmo, with me. Uh, and he will be actually uh, showing the stuff off in VS Code and running it and debugging it so you can see it in action. And for the uninitiated, what is Widgmo? In case you don't know, Widgmo is a collection of JavaScript UI components. Uh, we really target uh, enterprise application development. So the tough components that you don't want to develop yourself, uh, you want to buy a suite, save some time, and really um, ramp up your development quickly. Um, of course, we have our world famous Flex Grid in there. Uh, the grid is probably the most powerful and popular component in Widgmo. Uh, and we have data visualization controls like charts, gauges, input, navigation, uh, some analytical tools like OLAP and reporting. Uh, and all of Widgmo is available to use in pure JavaScript, so with no framework at all, or in Angular, React, or Vue as uh, native components in each of those frameworks. Uh, Chris, I do not believe the slides are currently updating on the oh, uh, broadcast. Thank you. Let's see here. Show my screen. There we go. Ah, uh, there we go. It changed. Okay, there well, you. thanks. Here we are. This is uh, Chris Bannon and Joel Parks. And this is Widgmo. And now you're up to speed. Thanks, Joel. Um, so the first thing I want to introduce, uh, this is a really exciting addition to Widgmo, is the Flex Map. Uh, mapping has been on our roadmap for a while now. Um, we've been doing a lot of research on it for the last couple of years, and uh, we finally came up with what we think is a really, really good solution to visualization for geographic data. Um, it is in beta for this release, but we really uh, strongly encourage you to try it out and send us feedback. Um, we will be refining it uh, over the next dev cycle. Uh, before we make it official, but it's absolutely ready to, to use in development. Um, and I, I should make the distinction, it is it is really just for visualization. It's not a map like a Google Map or Bing Map where you're uh, plotting uh, directions turn by turn or something like that. It's really just designed for visualizing geographic data. So uh, it does support two different uh, geographic formats. Uh, we have a GeoMap layer and that is for binding to GeoJSON data. Uh, and then we have a scatter map layer, and that is for binding to uh, specific coordinates uh, or points that uh, exist at a specific uh, longitude and latitude. Uh, the map control supports zooming, tooltips, data binding, uh, and the rendering is vector-based, similar to our flex chart. In fact, it extends the, uh, the chart base component uh, as well. And uh, the, the, the rendering will be optimized, so uh, you'll see very, very fast rendering speeds uh, in FlexMap, just like you do with FlexChart. Uh, and like with any other component in Widgmo, you can use it in JavaScript, and we've made it available to use in Angular, React, and Vue as well. So there's a few different visualizations you can do with FlexMap. Let's take a look at the first. The first is a choropleth map. Uh, these ones are my favorite. I feel like uh, they're a great way of really quickly demonstrating um, 
data for different regions uh, on a map. Um, so the idea is that you're plotting different geographic features. In this instance, it's uh, different states in the United States map. Uh, and you're applying a value to each region. Uh, and the value in this case is actually using a color scale API. So the color represents the value and you're really able to quickly glance at this and see what the cold states are and what the hot states are in the United States. So uh, before I talk anymore, I'm going to pass things over to Joel. Joel, if you could show us how to develop a choropleth map, uh, hopefully in JavaScript. Sure, just give me one second here. Mm -hmm. And looks like we're seeing VS Code on your screen. All right, perfect. So uh, <clears throat> first here, we're just gonna go over the, uh, the index.html file real quickly. Not a lot to go over here. Uh, as you can see in the body, we're just setting up a container, and inside that container, we've got a div with the ID of map. So now we'll hop over to the JavaScript file here. Um, at the top, we've just got all of our imports. Here we're using Bootstrap, uh, Widgmo's CSS file, and then a little bit of custom CSS. Uh, we're also importing our modules here. So first is the HTTP request module uh, from the Widgmo uh, uh, overarching module. Then we've got positions and palettes from widgmo.chart, uh, flex map, geo map, and color scale from widgmo.chart.map. Now inside of the uh, initialization function for our JavaScript file here, we've got the, uh, <clears throat> the initialization of our map control here. Uh, as you can see, we're tying it to that uh, div that was ID'd map. Inside that, we've got a couple of properties here. We've got our header, uh, which is set to average temperature by state. Legend, which we are positioning the legend on the left-hand side of the map. Our tooltip, which if the user hovers their mouse over a section of the map, it will display a little tooltip. And then our layers. Um, now the layer is what actually is going to be displaying the map on the screen. Here we're creating a geo map layer. The URL is where we're gonna be pulling our data from. Uh, for this sample, it's going to be us.json, which I'll pull up right here. Now, all this is, it's a pretty big file. Um, it's just geo.json, and we're going to use that to actually build out the map of the continental US that will get displayed. Now, we also have this uh, event here, item source changed. Um, what that does is whenever the item source gets set, um, and that is when the URL property gets read in the data, um, this event will fire. Here, we're just zooming to a specific layer on the map. In this case, it's the, uh, it's the GeoMap layer. Now, you can see I have a section of code here commented out. We'll uh, circle back around to that in a moment. Um, next, we have the data map variable. Now, this is set to a map object. This map object isn't a Widgmo map. Um, this is a list of key value pairs, kind of like a lookup table. And all we're doing is parsing the data from another JSON file here, our average temperature file, as you can see here, temp.json. And all that is is <clears throat> a list of objects with two values, a state, and an average temperature value. So we are iterating through them and setting them to our map uh, object. Now when that gets run, it looks something like this. So as you can see here, we've got a map of the US. Uh, you can hover over it and tooltips will display uh, based on the state that you're hovering over. But uh, right now it's currently just in a black and white state and we've got no legend displaying. So we'll come back to our JavaScript code and we will uncomment out this color scale section here. Now what this is, is what actually applies our color to our uh, map. The color scale property takes in a color scale object in this case. Um, we are setting the color scale colors property to a palette value. In this case, it is a red, yellow, blue diverging palette. Um, and we'll talk more about those later. Uh, the binding here, and we're binding to our data map uh, objects name properties. Uh, we've got a scale, and then we've got the format for what we're going to display on the legend. So now that that's been run, We'll swing back over here, and as you can see, it's been updated. We've got our diverging color palette going from dark blue for the coldest areas on the map 
through yellow all the way to dark red for the warmest areas on the map. And as you can see, you can still cover over and it will still show the tool tips. And that is how you create a choropleth map with Widgmo. All right, great. Thank you, Joel. So that's, um, yeah, like I said, that's my favorite visualization. It's a, you can really create some uh, stunning uh, charts and maps using that uh, that really uh, quickly, uh, you know, help people understand the data regionally. Okay, so another type of map is a scatter map. A scatter map uh, use, or uses different data. So rather than uh, specifying values for a region or a geometric shape, uh, you're, you're specifying, specifying data for an individual point or coordinates. So at a very specific latitude and longitude, you want to uh, apply a label or even a value. Um, so this one uh, is using uh, airports of the world, and it's putting a, a point exactly where each airport is. Uh, and you know, from an overview, you can see very quickly uh, where all the airports are in the world. Um, you know, the the chart or map, sorry, has no problem rendering uh, this. We do optimize it, like I said, just like flex chart, so you can have a lot of points, and you're not going to see much slowdown at all. So without further ado, let's go back to Joel. Joel, if you could show us now how to make a scatter map, uh, maybe this time in Angular instead of JavaScript. And I am seeing Visual Studio Code on your screen. All right, perfect. Yeah, and like, like uh, Chris mentioned, this time we're uh, working in Angular. Um, all of these uh, samples will be available on our demo site in like Chris said, uh, JavaScript, Angular, React, and Vue. Uh, you'll be able to run them there and download them there. Uh, so first, we'll be going over the component.html file here. Uh, pretty pretty uh, standard setup in terms of widget controls. So we've got our flex map here that has a header property, which we're just uh, setting as airport map. We've also got a tooltip content property, which we are setting in the markup here so that whenever users uh, mouse over any of the airports, it'll display a little tooltip. We've got the geo map layer. Now this is the layer that actually builds the map like I explained in the previous sample. Um, here we're setting the URL as land.json. Uh, once again, this is just a uh, geo JSON <clears throat> uh, data object here that we're using to actually build out the map. We are also setting some styling here. Uh, using the RGBA property. Now, moving on to the next object here, uh, we've got the WJ scatter map layer. Now, this is the layer that's actually going to point out, uh, plot all of the points. So as you can see here, we're setting the URL to our airports.json file. Um, so here, it's got a list of all of the airports. Uh, it's got name. Uh, coordinates and an IATI code um, that will be used uh, as you saw in the HTML here for our tooltip. Um, once again, uh, we have another item source changed event that we're binding this time to a method called zoom to that's going to do the exact same thing, just appropriately zoom us in. Um, we've got some stylings using uh, the RGBA property to set those. And then we are binding to the coordinates uh, property of our uh, airports.json objects. So as you can see here, each of them have a coordinates property that we're going to use to bind to. And then we have a geo grid layer. Um, this, all this does is plot a grid behind the map. So now we'll hop over to the component.ts file here. We've got all of our imports at the top. Once again, bootstrap, uh, Widgmo CSS file, and our own CSS file here, a little bit of custom CSS. For modules, we are also using Widgmo's WJ chart module and WJ chart map module. And then here, we've got that zoom to uh, method that is tied to our item changed event, or item source changed event. And all it's doing is zooming in so you have a good look at the current layer. So when we run that, we see this. So here's uh, all of the airports plotted out on the map. To give you a little bit of a better view, I will zoom in here and we will hover over one of these airports. And as you can see, a little pop-up 
the uh, abbreviation for that airport, and then the full name along with a little icon there. And that is how you use Widgmo's scatter map. All right. Thank you, Joel. Yeah, so that's an interesting one. Actually, that uh, that data uh, alerted me to the fact that there were islands in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I did not know that, and uh, I had to I had to submit a bug saying, "Are there really islands in the middle of the Atlantic, and is there really an airport on them?" But there are. So learn things new with maps. Okay, so uh, the last type of map we're going to show today is similar to a scatter map, only it adds another dimension of data to that map. Um, so you are plotting at specific coordinates, um, but this time the size of the point or bubble is bound to a value that it represents. Um, so in this instance, we're showing uh, the uh, GDP per capita. So the higher it is, the larger the bubble. Um, and then we can do things like uh, scaling the bubbles so that there's a, a minimum and a maximum so they don't, um, you know, get too uh, out of bounds with one another. So it's still readable uh, and you can customize positioning, things like that. So um, very similar to scatter map, but it, it's, it's uh, you know, has that distinct difference of being able to visualize another dimension of data. And going to pass things back to Joel. Joel, could you show us how to build a bubble map now? Yeah, sure, Chris. And we are seeing VS Code again. All right. So uh, once again, we'll be going over the uh, component.html file. This is, uh, once again, an Angular application. So uh, here we've got our flex, gra uh, flex map uh, being initialized again. Um, this time we're setting the header to Europe GDP per capita. And we are setting the tooltip co content property to a variable. Uh, you can either set the tooltips in the markup or you can uh, associate them with a variable if you'd like. Um, next, we have the geo map layer, uh, same setup as the previous sample. We've got our URL, which is tied to our geojson, which is in our uh, europe.json file. Uh, as you can see right here, just another geojson object. Um, and we are using the RGBA property to add some stylings to it. And we are once again tying a method, this time we're calling our method item source changed to the item source changed event of the geo map layer. Uh, and then with the scatter map layer, we are binding to three variables this time, uh, an X, a Y, uh, and a GDP variable. And we have two more properties here, the symbol max size and the symbol min size. So the way these work is that um, based on the value associated with the uh, plot point on the map, the uh, bubble will display at different sizes, larger depending on, larger the, the higher the value is, smaller the smaller the value is. So we just want to set a maximum and minimum size so they don't get too big or too small. Now we'll hop over to our TypeScript file here. So at the top, once again, all of our imports. Um, we have a couple more this time. We are uh, importing the WGA input module along with the chart and chart map modules. We are importing a method from a file uh, called data, and that method is get GDP data. We are importing the uh, point and rectangle classes from Widgmo's module. And then finally, we are importing the flex map class from Widgmo's widgmo.chart.map module. Uh, now I'll hop over to the get GDP data real quickly. Um, as you can see here, all this is, is it's returning a list of objects with a rank, a country, and a uh, year property. <clears throat> so we have hop back over to here. Um, we are using ViewChild to get our map control from our HTML file. Uh, here you can see we are setting the tooltip content um, to a variable and then assigning that variable <clears throat> to the property in markup. And then we have our item source changed event. So as you can see here, it's a little bit different this time than uh, when we were simply just using the uh, zoom method to zoom in on the map. So uh, just to go over a couple things real quickly here, um, the let features and the points variables. So let features here, um, layer dot get all features basically gets all of the um, map points from the current layer that we're on. 
and the points variable we're actually going to use uh, as our um, item source for our uh, scatter map here. So as we scroll down a little bit further, we have our GDP data, and we're using uh, we're setting that to the get GDP data method. Uh, we're creating another data map here, which we are then going to iterate through and set the country for each of the GDP data objects. And then finally, we'll be iterating through the entirety of that features list to uh, actually plot uh, or put each um, plot point into our points array and then pass that off as the item source. So uh, there's just two, two quick things to note really quick. Um, the, there are two if statements here, um, if name equals Norway and if name equals Russia, we are plotting those to two specific points. Uh, the reason that we're doing this is because whenever you are using uh, Widgmo's map to plot points, if it's in a country, it'll plot it right in the center. Um, for something like uh, a map of Europe, if it plants the uh, point right in the center of Russia, it's going to kind of blow out the map a little bit and give us more of a zoomed out view, same with Norway. So we wanna make sure that uh, the users have a good visual of that map. So we're just setting those two specific points so that we can maintain a consistent zoom level. Uh, and then uh, as you come down here, you can see we're pushing all of those onto our points array. We have an X coordinate, a Y coordinate, and that GDP coordinate, which we are binding to on the scatter layer. Uh, and then we are pushing it onto that layer's item source so that it can actually make use of those bindings. So when that gets run, you can see here, this is what it looks like. We've got our map here. You can hover over these points and it'll show you the name of the country, their current GDP, and their current rank. And that is how you implement a bubble chart using Wichmo. All right. Thanks, Joel. Um, so uh, as we developed these uh, maps, we really needed to rethink our palettes uh, in Widgmo. So we, we have had palettes since we first uh, released Widgmo uh, for FlexChart. Um, the, the limitation of those is that they were just nice looking palettes, you know, like you have an office. Um, and the, the colors were not meaningful in any way. They were just uh, colors that worked well together. Uh, so we needed some actual, um, uh, dynamic and data uh, influenced palettes uh, for map. Uh, to do that, uh, we looked to an open source project called Color Brewer. Uh, it was created by Cynthia Brewer. Um, I highly recommend you go check out colorbrewer2.org. It's a, a really neat site. They have a, a dynamic little playground where you can uh, test out all the colors, change some variables, and see how it impacts the palettes. But uh, essentially, there's three new types of palettes in Widgmo. There is a sequential, uh, and these are light colors that represent low values and dark colors that represent uh, high values. Uh, and then there is a diverging type, and that's where uh, the middle range is all light colors or usually like a white color, and uh, the lowest of the range is a dark color, and the highest of the range is a dark color. Um, that first uh, choropleth map, uh, the temperatures of the United States, was diverging. And you saw, you know, there was a dark blue for the very coldest uh, uh, states and then a, a dark red for the very, very hottest states. Um, so a very, very important tool in mapping is to have that uh, different dynamic palette. And then uh, there's qualitative. Uh, qualitative is uh, where the color used does not indicate the value at all. It's just used to differentiate um, one region or one point from another. Uh, and I would say the, the existing palettes in Widgmo before this past release uh, were qualitative. So uh, a, a really cool thing about adding these um, into our chart module is that not only do the maps benefit from it, but the charts do as well. So you can use these new palettes in FlexChart uh, and FlexPy and Financial Chart for that matter. So uh, Joel, if you wouldn't mind showing us how to leverage these new palettes with FlexChart. Yeah, I'd love to, Chris. And I'm seeing Chrome. 
All right, perfect. So uh, for, for this, we're actually going to go over two separate samples. Um, this one, uh, this first one is just kind of going to be to show all of the different palettes off. Um, and then the second one is actually going to be how uh, be how to use those palettes because uh, here uh, it's a lot of um, uh, variables being tied to one another. So uh, it's not necessarily the most accurate use case when you're going to be using these palettes. So uh, first we'll go over this. So you have to drop down here. These first ones are all of the palettes that were uh, available in Widgmo prior to this release. Um, as you scroll down here, you can see we've got our qualitative uh, palettes here. So as you can see, you can just click on this and it will show the accent palette and it will update both the bar chart and the pie chart here. Uh, as we go down a little bit more, you can see we've got our diverge, all of our diverging palettes here. Click on one of these just to show that off. Uh, we have our sequential sing singles, which, as Chris had mentioned, was just a light or a white color going to a dark color. So as you can see here, it goes from a very, very light orange, almost white, to a dark orange. And then finally, we've got the uh, sequential multi, which is the same thing as sequential single, except it's using multiple colors. So for example, here, this one's using uh, blue-green. So now we'll hop over here. And we will take a look at how you actually go about setting these. So first we'll open up our app.component.html file. So you can see here, pretty standard setup for both a chart and a pie control. You've got your headers, your footers, you're setting your item source here, <clears throat> and then binding the data property from that item source. Uh, the important thing to look at here is this palette object, or this palette property, sorry. Uh, this palette property is in each of these getting set to a different variable. The first one, a palette diverg palette diverging, and then the second, palette uh, qualitative. Those are both being set inside of our uh, component.ts file here. So we'll take a quick look at the imports. Um, uh, we're importing the importing the input and the chart modules from Widgmo. Also, our data service, all this is doing is getting the, the mock data that we're using in both the both charts, uh, the color class from Grape City slash Widgmo, and then we are importing the WJ chart, <clears throat> the entire WJ chart module here. So as we scroll down here, you can see our variables, palletative diverging and palette uh, qualitative. These are both being set through the WJ chart module import that we did. So as you can see here, it's simply uh, wjchart.palettes. Uh, and then based on the type of uh, palette that you want to use, um, here we're using both diverging and qualitative. And then we have the specific palette that we want to use along with, um, and the specific palette that we want to use out of those uh, out of those categories. So here it's brbg and accent. So we will run this real quick. just to uh, show you what the two different palettes look like and how you can explicitly set them. All right, and as you can see here, we've got our two different palettes going on with both charts. And that is how you make use of Widgmo's new palettes. All right, thank you, Joel. Uh, so that covers all of the new mapping features uh, in Widgmo. Um, as I said, it is in beta. Um, really the reason for us to keep it in beta is, uh, you know, if we get any uh, really critical feedback, uh, from customers, we have a little wiggle room to maybe make some API changes, uh, or uh, architecture changes. Um, but, um, there's nothing like that on the horizon. So I do feel confident that you could start using it, start building some prototypes with it. Um, and again, we do want feedback. Uh, there are plenty of features on the way as well, um, and uh, we, we will be adding some more plot types. Um, some other things in the roadmap for the FlexMap are packaging up some uh, country data as NPM packages. So uh, rather than you having to go and get GeoJSON data for um, some of those samples we showed, um, we would provide, you know, a set of certain countries and states and regions uh, that you could just import from NPM uh, and use them directly as a convenience. Uh, so yeah, look out for more coming soon, uh, but 
really excited to finally have a map in Widgmo. Uh, it's it's really really fun component to work with. Uh, and if you're not visualizing your geographic data yet, I, I highly recommend just giving it a try. It's really interesting to see your data plotted on a map. All right. Um, so the next item I want to talk about is the uh, REST collection view. Um, I would say uh, pretty frequently we get asked by customers, you know, what is the best way to connect uh, my Widgmo application to my backend or to my database uh, or to my web service. Um, and it, it is almost always some kind of uh, uh, API. Sometimes it's an OData service. Sometimes it's a, a homegrown service in C Sharp. Sometimes it's a REST API uh, or Java servlet. So uh, it, it's it's pretty common that we do see REST endpoints nowadays. So it's, it's getting more and more common. So uh, what we've done since we see this, this pattern repeating with customers, uh, we wanna make it much more easy uh, and kind of standardize it across the components. So we've created this REST collection view. Uh, this is not something usable on its own. So what it is, is it's a base class that gives you uh, all the boilerplate you need to very easily create your own uh, REST collection view uh, that extends ours. When you extend it, really the only thing you need to do is you need to point it at the URL of your own endpoint, your REST endpoint, uh, or different URLs for that matter, if you have different URLs for different actions. Um, and then there's, you know, there's four uh, key methods to override, right? You need to be able to create, you need to be able to read, you need to be able to update, and you need to be able to delete. Um, and if you provide overrides for those four methods, then our collection view uh, knows exactly what to do uh, when you interact with any of the controls. For example, in FlexGrid, if you edit a row uh, and you have um, provided an override for that update method, Grid calls the, uh, the update method in the collection view and it automatically tells your server to update, comes back with a response, updates the control. Um, so you don't have to write any of the code that's doing all that work. The only thing you have to do is provide the override for that method. Um, so it, it is a little upfront work for customers. It's work you already are doing, you know, calling, uh, web services. Um, but this way it's kind of a uniform way you're working in a collection view, which is observable. So it's very convenient for working in modern JavaScript applications. You can, bind, you can bind any number of Widgmo controls or any other part of your application to this collection view, and it'll just automatically do the communication with the server. So really, um, really a powerful addition. I think it, it will save customers a lot of time um, and help them with that, uh, that how do I connect my application to my database um, with Widgmo. So this one, you know, very confusing to explain. So I think the best thing to do would be for Joel to show us exactly what I'm talking about. Joel, I'm seeing uh, VS Code again. All right, perfect. So uh, first we'll, we'll be going over the uh, component.html and the component.ts files. Those will be relatively quick. They're pretty straightforward. And then we have a new file here, the REST collection view JSON uh, .ts file. Uh, that one will be going into a little bit more detail because that's where we actually go into talking about extending the REST collection view. So uh, first here, we've just got a simple uh, label that we're using along with our WJ collection view navigator uh, class to create a navigator so that users can uh, scroll through the different pages of the grid. And then we have the grid itself down here, um, the uh, along with a uh, flex grid filter. So if we jump over here to our component.ts files, um, going over the imports, once again, bootstrap, uh, Widgmo CSS file, and our own CSS file. Um, for imports, we are importing the WJ grid module, the WJ grid filter module, the WJ input module, and finally the REST collection view JSON class from our REST collection view JSON file. As you can see here, uh, we're setting this variable view to new REST collection view JSON, 
and we're setting a key and a page size to go along with that collection view. Um, and as you can see here, we'll hop back over to the HTML real quick. We're using that view variable as the item source for both our collection view navigator here, as well as the grid. So like Chris said, this uh, these um, uh, extended collection views can be used in multiple uh, controls with Widgmo simultaneously. So as we hop over to the rest collection view.json file, you can see up here at the top, we're importing Widgmo's rest collection view class from widgmo.rest. We are also importing HTTP request, copy as string and the assert classes from the Widgmo module. <clears throat> and as you can see here, um, we are taking the REST Collection View JSON class and ex using that to extend Widgmo's uh, REST Collection View class. Here, we are setting the URL, which we will actually use to make um, all of our uh, CRUD requests. Uh, in this case, we're just using a website, jsonplaceholder.typecode.com. Uh, and then we can scroll down a little bit further inside of our constructor. There's uh, just three variables I want to look at really quickly here the page on server, the sort on server, and the filter on server variables. So uh, Widgmo uh, is able to make use of your server's ability to page, sort, and filter server side, not on client side, so uh, that doesn't have to be handled by the, uh, the browser. In this case, uh, the data source that we're pulling from does not allow us to do that, so we are just setting these to false, so all of the paging and sorting and whatnot is going to be handled uh, client side instead of server side for this example. And we'll scroll down a little bit further here um, and we'll just go over the overrides very quickly. So this is our get, this will return all of the items uh, using an HTTP request. Um, down here we've got our add item method. Uh, what this does is uses an HTTP post request to add new items to our data source the patch item which is our update um, this uses an http put request to update whatever the user is currently editing and then finally our delete uh, right here which uses an http delete request to delete whatever uh, entry the user is currently working on so we'll spin this up here so you can take a look at that All right, and as you can see here, it loads up. We've got all of our data here. We've got our paging, whatnot. I will open up the console here and we'll just look at the XHR requests under the network tab. So really quickly here, I will delete a record. And as you can see, the request goes through for the delete. I will add a new record here. As you can see, another request goes through for that. And then finally, we will update another uh, record here and you can see that the update goes through as well and uh, that is the quick overview on how to make use of Widgmo's rest collection view class and extend that to create your own all right thank you Joel um, yeah so like I said that one it um, it does require some code uh, obviously on your part um, but I think it's well worth doing that um, because you know you're you're essentially creating a single a single place where you're doing the uh, communication with your server. Uh, also, when you're doing those overrides, that gives you an opportunity to you know if you want to scrub the data a little bit, if you want to do some more validation um, before or after. So it's it's a it's an interesting uh, architecture in that the code's still right there. You see the code, you write the code that actually calls the server. Uh, and then uh, Widgmo wires all of that up inside the controls to know when to call each of those methods, basically. Um, so I'm really, I'm really happy we have that, uh, especially with so many customers uh, asking and, and, and telling us they're using REST endpoints now. So uh, we hope it helps you. Um, and we, again, like feedback on that as well. That's something I do expect to be um, putting out a lot more demos for and examples, you know, using a bunch of different REST endpoints so you can see how to do it in different scenarios. Um, like Joel said, all of these demos are available on our website, so you can play with them yourself. 
Uh, we have a few more minutes. So uh, first of all, let me just thank everyone for coming. But uh, Joel and I will be hanging around for uh, some time to uh, answer questions, uh, talk about anything in more detail. Um, yeah, so please go ahead and submit questions. I'm going to look in the Q&A panel to see what we have. Pop this out so I can read it better. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so this is this is specifically dealing with uh, Firebase or AWS. So Widgmo actually already has a Firebase class that allows Widgmo's controls to connect directly to a Firebase data source. Um, Chris, you could probably speak a little bit more on AWS. I'm less familiar with that. Yeah, I, we don't have anything um, working with App, AWS AppSync yet. Uh, but that's one of those things where um, I, I think that that goes on our to-do list of, uh, of popular existing uh, frameworks that people are using um, that we should have some boilerplate code showing you how to do it. So we'll absolutely do something like that. Um, we did uh, put an interesting demo out. So we, we've had the Firebase, um, which was the Firebase collection view, which was in our uh, widgmo.cloud. Uh, module mm -hmm. we released a while ago. That one is is meant to connecting to Firebase. It does a lot more. You don't have to write those methods um, when you're using that. It's it's a little more magical than the REST collection view, uh, simply because Firebase already has a very well defined structure. Right. Uh, when we wrote the REST collection view, we have to realize. There's so many different ways that people are implementing REST endpoints and APIs that we we essentially had to leave those four override methods up to customers. Otherwise, um, our code would be huge if we were trying to account for all the different types of implementations. Um, but yeah, that's that's a very a very good point. Um, we will look into the AWS App Sync and and put together a, a demo that includes that. Oh, but one more thing about Firebase. So. Uh, while we do have the Firebase collection view, we also have the OData collection view. Those two are kind of like the magical ones. If you're working with those uh, server side specifically, um, but as like a, a test of REST collection view, we wrote uh, REST collection view extensions for OData and Firebase just just to prove that you could use you could extend the REST collection view to do the same connections, right? Um, so we do have boilerplate code on our demos that shows you how to write a REST collection view to Firebase if you'd want to do your own. But uh, really, that's just for the boilerplate code. If you want it, um, obviously, if you're using Firebase, we'd recommend you use the Firebase collection view directly. Great question. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I know we covered a lot. If there, if there are any features in Maps, uh, please uh, let us know. Uh, let's see, is the email address on the screen? It is. It's small, though. So widgmoexperts at grapecity.com. That email address uh, gets, uh, gets your question or feedback in front of our engineering team. So uh, if you have problems, suggestions, anything, I highly recommend contacting that email group. Um, you know, I'll, I will always see everything that goes through there. So. Uh, feel free to do that anytime. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll hang out here. Let's see. We'll take a few more minutes. We'll just hang around. And um, if anybody has any more questions, feel free. Unfortunately, I don't have any uh, hold music or anything to play. Oh, you know what, Joel? Uh, would you be able to um, actually go from the uh, website to those demos so people could see how to find them on yeah no problem chris when you want to toss back know. control real quick yep all right i'm changing you to the presenter all right and feel free to keep asking questions all right can you see my screen here yep i'm seeing the the browser 
All right, perfect. So uh, the website that all of our demos are located at, it's at grapecity.com slash widgmo slash demos. That'll bring you right to this page. Um, we've got our popular mod, uh, modules and our reference apps here. Um, you can just click on any of these to uh, actually go to, uh, to that demos module. But if you look here on the left-hand side, um, you can see all of our different modules that, that Widgmo offers here. So for example, if you hop down to the maps, you'll actually be able to see all of the demos that we went over here today. Uh, also, you can check them out in each of the different frameworks. Just click on it, it'll boot up that framework's uh, iteration of the application. Um, and then over here on the right-hand side, um, you can make changes to the code if you want to show different things. Uh, you can just hit the play button to uh, rerun it. And then there's also another little zip button here. You can press to download the sample that you're currently viewing. Uh, and you can play with that locally. Cool. And we have samples for all of our Widgmo modules here. Like Chris mentioned, we have our cloud module with Firestore and Firebase, et cetera. Yeah, that's honestly, um, that, that the demo resource is invaluable. I, I often use that myself when I need to copy some code or, or get a feature uh, to send to uh, help a customer out with. So uh, it's, a, it's a great learning source, um, you know, even for people that use the product daily. All right, well, we are at the end of our time. Uh, doesn't look like there's any more questions. Uh, I'm going to end the webinar. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, and we will be uh, publishing a recording of this uh, sometime later. So thank you all. See ya. Yep. Thanks, everyone.